on the bike and today we're going to go in here to Canada and we're going to talk about art with a wonderful artist. Okay. Well, now we're going to talk with uh, Kathy Bradford who has very graciously accepted a uh, an opportunity for a little interview. We're going to make this short, not too uh, tedious. Well, first of all, tell us a little bit about the show. All, Title. The, all these paintings are new, and most of them have water and swimmers in them. Okay. I didn't set out to make it a, paint, a show about water swimmers and painters <laughs> and swimmers, but. This one, this one is called Swim Team, Team Miami, and I was influenced by going down to Miami in December. For the Miami day. Art Fair? Yeah, Miami Art Fair. Oh. It's all warm and steamy. And Let's uh, stroll into the main gallery and I'll get down to the really annoying questions. Well, uh... One of the things I wanted to ask you about is this is uh, your first show with Canada and uh, we've talked a little bit about it. You don't have to get too specific, but uh, what are your thoughts about uh, sort of changing galleries, doing different things? I, I, I'm for it. Yes. <laughs> James Kyle. <laughs> okay, that's a, that's a very explicit uh, answer. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about was that uh, this latest batch of paintings you're using acrylic. Now, uh, as I remember, you're mostly an oil painter. That's right. This, this painting over here called Fear of Waves. Let, let's take a look at Fear of Waves. This is the, the namesake of the show. Right. This is an oil painting because I started it two years ago. And it took me that long to paint, so I finished it in oil. The rest are acrylic. And what, what made you decide to uh, change mediums? Mainly because I wanted to use their fluorescent paints. Ah. Oh. If, you, if you see, like, see that green one? That's yes. fluorescent green. Absolutely. And a lot of the light coming from these two is fluorescent red and fluorescent orange and fluorescent blue. That's fluorescent blue all around there. It's just a... It's just an exciting color to work with. And you felt like you couldn't get the same kind of uh, punchy colors using oil? No, I couldn't. I'm sure I couldn't. Okay, let's take a look at this piece I, over here. I couldn't get, I couldn't get the kind of uh, glow, like this kind of stuff. Doesn't this look like fluorescent? That's yes, it I does. Like. You know, and the other thing is that, uh, okay, I'm a painter myself and I've been watching your work for a long time and I, I really didn't uh, realize that you had uh, switched over to acrylics until I looked at the, uh, the gallery listings. Now, we're looking at this piece and this also brings up another point. Is this painted on a drop cloth? Because I see the little, uh, the little seams in here. So, someone gave me this stretcher. It's the biggest painting I've ever done. Really? So this is six by eight feet, something like that? I, I don't know, it's a hundred and something across. Oh. I was really intimidated by it. And I, the only piece of canvas I had that was big enough was the drop cloth on my studio floor. And when I stretched it, it looked 
great, just the way it was, but also like a lot of other people's paintings. And, and I worked on it for a couple of years, but finally finished it just before the show. Well, this also kind of uh, brings up another point. <clears throat> you know, Chris Martin, one of your friends, has been using drop cloths for years. But maybe you could talk a little bit about, uh, you've got a group of friends, painters, that you've kind of hung out with for stolen years. Stolen ideas from Yeah, well, <laughs> and they've stolen ideas from you. So Chris Martin is one of them, Bill Jensen, Margaret Lucek, uh, Peter Acheson. Um, well, you know, the reason why I know about this gallery is one of my students named Brennan Cass. Yes. Knew about Canada when they were in Christie Street, when they were a young, scrappy gallery. And he took me down there and he introduced me to them. And he said, you should show Catherine Bradford. And they took note. And I always went to their openings and I got to know the work and I thought they were a really interesting place. I always wanted to be part of this gallery. And now you are. <laughs> well, they gave me their big monster room, which, which at first I just was overwhelmed. Like, I, you know, I, I've done little paintings for years. Yes. And I, I didn't see how I could have a show in this space. Well, so I had to, I had to slow work. I was for intimate viewing. But you know, you know what's been surprising about this show is how many people have gotten up close to these and taken uh, details and put it on Instagram. Well, that's one of the reasons that I was kind of wondering because you get this great uh, sense of uh, the overlays, the glazes, and uh, there are not a lot of people that are using acrylic that can use use it in that way and get to such a nice and rich surface. But, but listen, all you do is add a lot of water. You know, talking about friends, the whole summer I was working on these, I was writing an essay about Catherine Bernhardt. She, ah. she has a book coming out. She also shows here, doesn't she? Or she does. She has shown with them, yes. But she was very much on my mind. I was really thinking about her work. And she adds a whole lot of water to her acrylic paint. Uh -huh. It gets all these great effects. And so I tried it. I mean, adding water is inexpensive. <laughs> um, and like, I think that's how this I mean, Actually, this is kind of dry. But anyway, I, I found out I could layer color over color. Well, come with me. We're going to walk over to the other side of the, uh, the show. Uh, you know, terms like breakthrough show and uh, people saying that it's, it's your time, let's go down to the next one, uh, things like that. You've been painting in the scene for a while, and I read a little uh, tribute that your son wrote. Why don't you talk a little bit about how you got to New York when you came, some of the challenges that you would face as a single mother trying to break into the art scene. Um, I just want to tell you that my son is a writer. He's a fiction writer. <laughs> and he, as I've watched him hone his craft, and he told that story beautifully. And what people are going to remember about it is single mother, pull out couch, uh, what's it called? Cooktop, uh, stove. A single burner <laughs> yeah. hot plate. Hot plate that I was using a hot plate to make dinner, which is more or less true. But anyway, he painted a sort of romantic bohemian picture of me. Bless him. Bless him. But when I got to New York with these two kids, it was a very uh, challenging place, not very friendly. It was very hierarchical. The, um, so when was this, the early 80s, in, in late the 70s? 80s, yeah. Okay. The, the artists that I'd been reading about when I was living in Maine... Keep talking, I'm going to pan, pan over this painting. I, I knew all about them because I read the Were you moving here from Maine? Yeah, I moved here from Maine. 
huh? with two school-age kids, and I, I, I read art magazines obsessively, and because there was no internet, and I wanted to meet all those artists that I'd been reading about, but they didn't want to meet me at all. It, if you went to an opening, the important artists would only talk to the other important artists. And they would just ignore you even if you approached them and tried to talk to them. <laughs> so I had no one to talk to. And that's where you started to uh, kind of gather your little coterie of friends, Rick Briggs and Chris Martin and Peter, and, and they've pretty much stood beside you and you've, like you said, stolen ideas, they've stolen ideas from you. Thank goodness. Is that, a, you think that was a very good, uh, way for you to kind of work your way into the art world is yes, have well, people well, and backers? Yes. First of all, we, we went to Brooklyn, which was a new idea in the 80s. Okay. There, there was not an art community in Williamsburg. And so we, I found one with artists who were much younger than me. So they were all five and six years old at the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I learned, I learned a great deal from them. People like Chris Martin is terrifically ambitious and taught me how to use my time. And well, you know, big. yes, I think I did a review of a show that you did about six or seven years ago at Ed Thorpe. And uh, I guess we've probably known each other for 10 or 12 years at this point. Uh, what's nice is that we're kind of getting to that point of the of the movie where some of these people that uh, have been your friends and stuff, they're breaking out in their own, they're having their own breakthrough shows, getting a lot of attention and sort of moving up the, the status uh, chain of the New York art world. Yeah, we're, we're all players now, wouldn't you say, <laughs> James Cobb? I don't know, I don't know. Let's go over and look at this you other know, wall. It's, it's been one of the most satisfying things about being an artist in New York is seeing the, seeing the stories of my friends unfold and seeing them realize their dreams. We, we all had dreams and it's a wonderful feeling to have some of them come true. Yes, before the final chapter closes. <laughs> exactly, before we kick the bucket. These are just kind of uh, frameworks that you're actually sort of hanging abstract painting compositions on her. Maybe it's abstract painting compositions that you're hanging no, figurative you're things right. on her. You're right. That is so true. I didn't want these to be called bather paintings because it connected them too much with the history of art because I feel they're, mo they're about fields of color. They're about the language of painting, which is what I'm interested in. Well, in many ways, I was kind of, you know, from a distance, I could almost think about a Pollock with this piece. You could? <laughs> well, I'm not, not <laughs> excuse me, I mean a Rothko. Well, there is some splashing and some drippy stuff in there. No, I was thinking of Rothko, kind of the way you've divided this, you know, these t two I think about color that. sections against each other. You've put your little figures kind of floating in this ephemeral space. Turn your camera over there, there's some heavy dudes over there. Heavy dudes. You see hey, that yeah. Jason Stopa? I do see Jason Stopa. Yeah, some of the local painters. Come on down the line here. Does this one make you think of Rothko? No. Jackson Pollock. I do you have, do have some, some splatters on there. You know, one of the things is that when I came to the opening and I uh, I was thinking about doing some video there, but it was so packed that I thought, you know, it'd be better to come back and maybe talk to you. But I was looking at this particular painting at the time, and you were talking about uh, fluorescent colors, and I was thinking, gee, this is almost too harsh. You know, it's almost like the, uh, the red is too red, the green is too <laughs> gaseous. But then I came back last weekend, and... Uh, just walked through the gallery with two or three other people and uh, I could really see that the color thing was working a lot better and it wasn't quite as um, hard on the, uh, the eyeballs as, uh, as I thought and now I'm thinking that there is a lot of actually kind of nice subtle color things going on. I don't want to do nice. <laughs> 
it's not nice in that way. It's nice from a painterly aspect. You, know, you, you can be as badass as you want to. If, if you paint people, yes. you, don't, you don't have this problem, but the, oh, I there's paint a people. terrible challenge with what color you're going to make them. What color skin. And I did an awful lot of pink here, but this color was the one that, that, uh, that Matisse used for his Ode to Joy, the women dancing in a circle. Yes. It's sort of a dark red, which is a great color in itself. But I don't think they had fluorescent colors back in 1912 or whenever he did that painting. But he could, he could certainly jack it up with the contrast. You know, let's uh, look over at these two little pieces while we wrap up. Now, what do you think about uh, the people that are saying this is your breakout? I mean, you're probably old enough to have had two or three breakout shows now at this point. But a lot of people were saying that uh, this really kind of establishes you as a as maybe a major, major painting talent in New York. And it only took you how many? <laughs> 35 years of constant work? Something like that? You know, when people came up to me at the opening and said that kind of thing, younger artists, yes. I just looked them in the eye and I said, never give up. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point. And do you feel, I mean, do you feel like uh, people are taking you more serious now for some reason? You know, there are a few people that are a little nicer to me. Well, tell me who they are. <laughs> I don't think I will. <laughs> let's, let's go to this last painting. This, this painting was kind of a dark blue, and I was very dissatisfied with it. So, in a fit of disgust, I painted the whole thing over in light blue, but I could still see these figures, so I kind of pulled them out of the paint and let some surprise things like these fish. It took me a while to get this person not to look like a dead person, and I gave them little trails of wakes. You know, I also, I was, uh, I was sort of surfing the art blogs last week and I saw a headline that kind of caught my attention. It said uh, something to the effect of Kathy Bradford, uh, gender politics and pain or something like that. I think it was at uh, Art Fag City, some, one of the blogs. Has that kind of approach, maybe that kind of political thinking ever been involved in uh, the way you think about what you're doing as a painter? Gender politics? Well, that's what the headline said. <laughs> I mean, no, I don't. You know, that, that big painting there is called Fathers, and I suppose you could read a great deal into what I meant by putting a circle of men in a pool and calling it Fathers. Okay. I, I'm not sure what I did mean, actually. But you would say, you say you're basically just a straight-ahead painter, and that's what mostly interests you? Or do you no, feel you want to? Straight ahead. Do you feel like you want to have different kinds of references, different levels of of uh, appreciation? I think I'm talking about humanity, a human condition. Right in 2016. 2016, yeah. What when you look at this painting, are you thinking about gender politics? I only mention that because I saw somebody who was writing for a blog. Maybe they'd write those kinds of things just to get viewers to uh, click onto the articles. I always thought of you as just a, a painter, and like we we're saying, you've got a couple of different bodies of work, and in certain ways, there's always that uh, that abstract element. I think is always kind of popping its head up here and there. Well, John Yao wrote that my work was a meditation on masculinity. Really? Because <laughs> because uh, I, I made the Superman less than yes. mighty. I, I kept doing the Superman as a very human, vulnerable looking person. Right. I, I, like my, I like all the characters in my paintings to be exposed and vulnerable. And I think that's why I put them in bathing suits. I, I'm really not up to having nudes, but 
if you're standing there with just a little bit of clothing on, I think you're, you're, you're naked in front of everyone. And I think that's a very exciting thing to paint emotionally. Well, when you're uh, standing in a gallery full of uh, all the paintings that you've done in the last, uh, what do you say, two years? Something like that? That's kind of like being naked too, isn't it? Yes, a little I, bit. I, I'm sure that that goes through my mind. Okay, Kathy Bradford, we're gonna let you put your clothes back on. <laughs> Thanks for graciously coming with us and giving us a little time to talk about the paintings. Thank you so much, James Tom. And uh, good luck, tell us the show is at Canada, Fear of Waves, and it's on until when? It's on until February 14th. Okay, come by and see it. And you know what we say at the end of every time we do a video. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Yeah, thank you, Kate.